Welcome back to Immunology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe. All right, in the previous video, we talked about the classical pathway of complement activation. And I mentioned and tried to emphasize the classical pathway requires antibodies for it to work. And we know that upon, pro upon initial exposure to an antigen, we don't have antibodies for the antigen. It takes time to develop those. And so you can imagine that the classical pathway is not going to be the first pathway activated, particularly when we have initial exposure to an antigen. So when we have initial exposure, we're going to have to fight that with different pathways of activation in terms of complement. Okay? And so one of those pathways, which is what we're going to discuss here, is called the lectin pathway of complement activation. Now, how is this different? Number one, it doesn't require antibodies, which is good for us. Number two, it's going to require sugars on the surface of the membrane of the foreign invader. So if we have a bacteria, um, they're going to have things like glycoproteins on their surface, and the sugar part of that is going to be recognized by proteins of the immune system. Okay? And those proteins that recognize sugars specifically are called lectins. Okay, so that's a very important term. A lectin is any protein that binds sugar. So they're sugar binding proteins. There's a lot of different lectins that we have, and this is just a very general term. The one that's going to be very important here is called MBL. MBL stands for mannose binding lectin. So this particular lectin in the complement activation is going to bind mannose with very high specificity. So here's an example of uh, an oligosaccharide. And we see that it's in an end linkage to an asparagine residue. Um, that's one type of linkage that we have. And this asparagine is just going to be part of some protein on the surface of a bacterial cell, for example. So this is a glycoprotein, and this is the glyco, the sugar component of it. And the, the mannose binding lectin would bind these mannose residues on the edge over here. Now, mannose binding lectin is associated with another protein, and that protein is called a MASP. MASP stands for, now this is complicated, the M is for MBL. So this is mannose binding lectin associated serine protease. So the MASP is a serine protease. Now, this is a picture you might be wondering why I have this. This is from the classical pathway. That's C1. That's the complement protein C1. It has a Q component and then the RS component, which are the serine proteases. Over here, I have a protein, if you'll notice, it looks very similar, very similar to C1. This protein right here is called mannose binding lectin and MASP. Okay, it's, it's a combination of the two proteins. The MBL is what binds the, the sugars, and then these other proteins are going to be your MASPs, the serine proteases. Okay. So it's going to function in an identical way to C1. So remember when C1 bound the antibody, it became activated and it split C4, right? In exactly the same way when, when this protein, mannose binding lectin, binds mannose on the pathogen surface, the mannose binding lectin is going to undergo a change in conformation, which causes a change in conformation of the MASPs, the mannose binding lectin associated serine proteases, and then those MAPs are going to split C4 into C4A, which floats away, and C4B, which remains bound to the surface of the pathogen. And literally from here, the story is exactly the same. I'm going to go over it a little more quickly than I did in the previous video just because it's the same, but understand that if you want more, a little more detail on the path from here, you can find it in the previous video on the classical pathway. But other than that, it's exactly the same. The only thing different is the starting point. So mannose binding lectin binds the mannose residues on the pathogen surface. Change in conformation leads to change in conformation of the MASP, which causes them to become activated, and MASP splits.
C4 into C4A and C4B. Like I mentioned, some of the C4B becomes bound on the surface of the pathogen. Um, we also have, depending whether it's MASP1 or MASP2, these proteins, these enzymes, can activate also C2 into C2B. Now, I'm going to mention this in this video again because I don't want to cause confusion. Again, you can find it in the previous video. All of these proteins, whether it's C4, C2, C3, and C5, whenever they are split by a serine protease, there's an A component that floats away and a B component that stays bound. When these proteins were being named, there really wasn't consistency. This is kind of in their infancy. But once people got, to get, got together, actually fairly recently, they wanted to say, well, all the B components remain bound, as in right here. The A components float away. A for away, B for bound. C2 is kind of the exception because it was not named correctly, and people do acknowledge this. The older naming system has C2A remaining bound and the B component floats away. If you look at older texts and older sources, they keep this nomenclature. Newer sources throw that out and reverse it to do the new convention, which is that the B protein remains bound and the A protein floats away. So what I'm going to say is C2B and C4B remain bound. Okay, That keeps it consistent and actually a lot of the newer sources are doing that. So we have C4B, C2B, you would see a C2B right here, and together they're going to form C3 convertase, just as we saw in the classical pathway. And what does this C4B and C2A together have? Like I said, C3 convertase activity. What does a C3 convertase do? It takes C3 and splits it in two. C3A, which floats away, and C3B, which remains bound, um, and it actually is going to bind to the membrane of the pathogen. Okay, And if you want to know how that works, go back to the previous video and watch that. I go into a little more detail there. Suffice it to say, though, once we have C4B, C2B, and C3B bound together, these three proteins now are not a C3 convertase, they are now a C5 convertase. So when I have bound C4B, C2B, C3B, they are now a C5 convertase. And in the same way that a C3 convertase splits C3 into C3A and C3B, you could imagine a C5 convertase split C5 into C5A and C5B. And again, I went over this in more detail in the classical pathway because um, these pathways are virtually the same after the initial step, but once I have that C5 convertase C4B, C2B, C3B, that C5 convertase is going to split C5 into C5A, which floats away, and C5B. And again, I'll talk about this now, but I went over it in more detail in the previous video. C5B again is going to insert itself into the membrane, and it's going to recruit a host of other proteins. That is C6, C7, C8, and a bunch of C9 proteins that are going to insert themselves into the membrane of the pathogen in an orientation like this. That orientation of these C9s not only penetrates completely through the membrane and into the intracellular space or the cytosol, but it forms a pore. That pore is referred to as a MAC or membrane attack complex. Why is it called a membrane attack complex? Because it's attacking the pathogen. This pore now allows things out and allows things in the cell can no longer regulate its internal environment, and so it bursts, it undergoes cell lysis. So membrane attack complexes kill the cell in question, okay? So what is the key here with membrane attack complex in the lectin pathway? Well, the lectin pathway is identical to the classical pathway, except through the initial step. The classical pathway, if we go back, requires antibodies bound to antigen. And those antibodies activate a protein called C1. And then C1 activates C4 and C2. And from there, the, the story is the same as the lectin pathway. 
The lectin pathway starts off differently. It requires a different protein, which is actually very similar in structure to C1. Instead, that's MBL and MASP. But once they bind the sugars on the surface of the cell membrane of the pathogen, MASP becomes activated, and it activates C4 and C2, and the story is the same from there. So, like I said, and I, I prefaced it in this video, the lectin pathway is almost identical to the classical pathway, except for that initial step. In the classical pathway, it's antibodies activating C1. In the lectin pathway, it's sugars activating MBL and MASP. But, again, the same from there we get membrane attack complex. Now, by far the most different pathway of complement activation is the alternative pathway. This is going to involve something very different, and this is going to be the topic of the next video, and we're going to do this one in a little more detail than the lectin pathway because it's different. We had already covered the classical pathway, so the lectin pathway is the same story, just a different start. Alternative pathway is very different. Okay, We're going to cover that in the next video. So thank you for watching this video on the lectin pathway. Join us in the next video when we talk about the alternative pathway. Thank you.